speak this morning, I would like to pray the, the Ephesians prayer one more time. It's Ephesians chapter 2, or I'm sorry, chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. And then after that, we will be turning to Romans 8. But let's pray this prayer together. Ephesians 1, 15. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. And this is the prayer that the Apostle Paul prayed. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Lord, we do thank you, and Lord, we do seek the knowledge of you, the revelation of you by your Holy Spirit, the riches of Christ towards us, the riches of God that we have in Christ, our inheritance. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. When we think of the heart of God, as we turn to Romans 8, we think of the heart of God towards us as people or towards people, mankind in general. What is the value that I have before God? What is the value that each and every one of you has before God? Because we can feel pretty insignificant. We can see, we feel like we're insignificant and that we just live day to day. But the Bible tells us that God treasures each individual. Each person is treasured by God treasured, that the value that each and every one of us individually have before God surpasses the value of the whole world, the value of one individual person exceeds the value of what God put on Christ in that he was separated from Christ and would have been separated for one individual person. And the value, if we truly have the heart of God in us, if we truly understand the heart of God as Christians, when we see the people of the world, the lost, that they would have that kind of value. We know that the life of Christ in us, in us manifests by our love to the brethren, right? To other believers, we have love to them. Do we have the heart of God towards the lost? And I was thinking of that a little bit this morning, and I had heard something that really made me think. Uh, there was a story that back in the early 90s, and I believe it was in Los Angeles, and I would have to go look it up again to know the details of this case, but there was a traffic officer that was handing out park, parking tickets. And there was a car that was illegally parked. And there was a man sitting in the car, appeared to be asleep. And the officer writes the ticket as he walks by, and he walks up, and he just reaches past the guy, sticks it on the dash, and goes on his way. Well, when they found later that the guy had actually was the victim of a murder, had been shot sitting there, dead in his car, and gets a parking ticket that he had been dead long before the parking ticket was ever even written. And that's kind of the way I'm thinking that many times we approach unsaved people like this, that we don't see them in their dead spiritual state. 
And insult to injury is, I don't know if he had to pay the parking ticket or not. I never heard that part of the story. I know he received a parking ticket, but we will make demands of those who are spiritually dead. Why don't they behave better? Why don't they do this if they would only not do that? But dead people act just like dead people do. And we can't demand anything from a non-believer because they are still spiritually dead. In Romans 8, last week we talked about the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and it was very much an overview. Really didn't get into real depth. But in Romans 8, we see what life in the Spirit is like. What is life like living in the Spirit? And let's read Romans 8, 1 through 14. And then we'll do a few brief comments on this, and that will be it. But it will give us enough to think about it. Because truly, the true learning, that we, the things that stay with us and impact us, are the things that the Holy Spirit ministers to us, many times not in the church service, but after we have gone and we contemplate the things that we have heard. We contemplate the Word of God. We meditate on the Word of God. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Jesus Christ, in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do is that in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. He didn't condemn us. He condemned the sin in the flesh or overcame the sin that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, or they obey the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. It's like the magnets that oppose each other. The flesh and the spirit, they're opposed. The carnal mind, it cannot obey the things of the spirit. And it's not subject to the things of God. It cannot obey it. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh. You are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ... He is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken or make alive your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells in you. Therefore, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh, but if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you, through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Living by the Spirit. We know that when we are born again, that the Spirit comes into us to indwell us. Now, Something to recognize in the 8th chapter of Romans. It begins with no condemnation, and it ends up, if you read completely through it, with no separation. But just to cover a little bit, what do we mean, because there's a lot of things we talk about, what do we mean when we say the old man, or the new man, or the flesh, the spirit? And just a quick thing, and there are many different... Uh, or, or at least several different explanations of this. But the old man, we hear about our old man, our natural man, the man that we were born to be or person that we were born to be when we were born. When we are born again, 
we are told in the Bible that when we are saved, when the Holy Spirit comes in to live in us, that our old man is crucified with Christ. We begin to identify with Christ in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. We become co-crucified with Christ. My old man, I don't have to worry about anymore. He is gone. He no longer exists. He's no longer there at all. And I become the man that's talked about in Psalms that the Bible says, blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Sin will no longer be charged to me. I may suffer the effects of it. I may suffer effects of living a sinful life, but it will no longer be charged to my account. Because why? I am no longer that man. I am a new creation in Christ Jesus. I have become what? I have become the new man. I am a new creation in Christ. I have become a spiritual man, a spirit man. My spirit now has is become alive and can commune with the Holy Spirit where it could not before because I was subject to the things of the old man. Furthermore, I have become someone of a new race. I have become, and we think of race as the color of our skin, where we were born, as likely determines what race that we are. But we have become a new race of people who are spiritually alive. We are a new type of person. People who are spiritually alive. Being new that there was not any before. I was not like this before, but now I am something created new. I am now a member of... I have membership in the kingdom of God. I am now a new man, a member of a new race of people. Because, and then we have what we talk about is the flesh. That Satan attacks us through what? The world and the flesh, through our minds, through our souls. And when I speak of the flesh, I'm talking about the way my natural being this body and my senses interacts with the world system. And this is what we are cautioned about, of not walking after the flesh, after the things that dic are dictated to me through my senses. But I walk by faith in the Spirit, after the things of the Spirit of God. Because if I walk after the flesh and this world system, what's that going to lead me to? Nothing but t death. I will have like the Midas touch where King Midas supposedly touched things and they turned to gold. I will touch things and they will die because nothing that I put my hand to will prosper. Death will take hold in my relationships. Death will reign in everything that I put my hand to from an eternal perspective. I will accomplish nothing of eternal value living after the flesh. So the natural question is, like this, as believers, do we spend our whole life on earth just frustrated, struggling against the flesh, and always being defeated because this sin that dwells in me, and is there no power provided to achieve victory? And I can say there's good news for all of us because Romans 8 lays this out. In Christ Jesus. The Apostle Paul writes a lot about the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul. Speaks a lot of being in Christ. Ephesians is filled with the little phrase, in Christ Jesus. Because there is no more condemnation, in Romans 8.1, to those who are in Christ Jesus. There is therefore no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. So, how is this received, this power to overcome sin or to be free of condemnation? It's received in Christ Jesus. What does this mean? It means to be saved. When we are born again, we are baptized 
into Christ Jesus. Not talking about water at all. It's talking about being immersed in Christ. Because we have denominations and religions that put all their trust in being placed in water. And I can tell you, water has no power except maybe to make your body clean, if you use some soap. But this is not talking about being cleansed by water. It's talking about being cleansed by being immersed in Christ Jesus, to where when God views us, the righteousness of Christ is represented to him as he views us. There is now, there is therefore, now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Being in Christ. 164 times in the 13 epistles that, the Paul, wrote, that Paul wrote that he refers to in some way of being in Christ. Because when we are in Christ, we are joined to Christ in his death, where our old man is put to death, his burial, where everything of our old man is hidden, to his resurrection, to where we are created as a spiritually alive person who is able to commune, that our spirit communes with the Holy Spirit. Can we be free from sin in this life? My flesh will not be, but in my spirit there needs no more be controlled by sin. My flesh, my body even, will not be controlled by sin to the, to the extent that I walk after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Jesus Christ, in Christ Jesus, has made me free from the law of sin and death. What have we said? We've said before, what is a law? A law is a principle that will bring about an absolute end. What do I mean by that? Law of gravity, right? I hold this out. I can defy that law for some time. And I won't put it to a test. But I can defy that law of gravity for a while. But what happens? As I begin to tire, it begins to take its effect. And the book will lower. Even without the book, just holding my arm out. At some point, the law of gravity will overtake me. And I will not be able to defy it indefinitely. This is what happens when we in our flesh decide that we will defy the law of sin and death. And for a while I can do that. For a very short while. But then I will see the law of sin take over and I will make some... I was raised believing that these weren't really sins. But I would make some mistake because of the weakness of my flesh. They're sins. Believe me, they are sins. And I will commit a sin. And ultimately, as my flesh ages and becomes weak, and I said, in time, it will bring about that result. What is going to happen to my flesh? My flesh will die. If you meet someone that says they have overcome the law of sin and death in their flesh, all you have to do is look to see if they have any gray hair, they're getting older. It's, it's the law of sin and death is taking over. They're getting closer to death. I've not met any people that are three or 400 years old that are still looking young. Why? Because the law of sin and death is taking its toll on them. The law of sin and death always takes its toll on our flesh. But... There is another law that overcomes the law of sin and death. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus makes us free from the law of sin and death. And here's an illustration. You know, I flew to Japan. I forget what this plane was but, that, that I flew on, but it was enormous. I mean, th just to give some perspective, there were over 500 seats in this plane. Over 500 people on this plane enormous plane and you look at this much bigger than my house and I'm thinking wow can this enormous plane fly can this thing actually all this weight 
They say that a 747 jet weighs over 836,000 pounds. Can all of this defy the law of gravity? All this mass? But when the power of those engines come on, and with the law of aerodynamics, this plane is able to lift itself 35,000 feet or higher and travel over 500 miles an hour. It's incredible. And they, they have a little screen there where they'll tell you how fast you're going. And, you know, it's usually 530-something miles an hour or whatever and how high you are. And you're thinking, wow, this thing is enormous. How did we defy the law of gravity with something so large? But the law of life in Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus makes us free from that law of sin and death. The law of the spirit of life is the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. My flesh will perish, but my spirit man will live eternally. We talked about being free from sin. Should we continue to live in sin because we have grace? The Apostle Paul said, God forbid. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. In other words, the law, what the law was. Talking about here, the law of Moses. It was a list of things that your flesh should, be, should adhere to. You know, like the Ten Commandments. You know, love God and don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't do these things. There were many, many, many laws given to Israel. And guess what? They weren't able to keep them. No one ever was able to keep the law. It says, what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, the flesh was unable to ever obey that law. And furthermore, they say, the Bible tells us that the strength of sin is in the law. If you want to make someone sin, give them law. And they will, they will sin every time. As soon as you try to resist, your flesh craves sin even more. But God came to do something about sin. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. He came to do something about it, and that is to destroy sin. He's stating that there will be freedom from sin in Christ Jesus. Freedom from sin that, first off, we will not be charged for sin because we are in Christ Jesus. We are the righteousness of Christ. But we will not, even in our flesh, we will not be under the dominion of sin even though our flesh is not perfected, that we will not be controlled or under the dominion of sin. God accomplishes this deliverance by sending his son in the likeness of sinful man. And I'm going to share a little, um, a little poem that I thought was kind of cute. And we'll, we'll close with this, but the Lamb of God, Jesus is the Lamb of God. His mother's name was Mary, right? Now you can see the likeness of the little nursery rhyme that we used to, to, to know when we were kids. And I just thought this was kind of cute but very true. It says, Mary had the little lamb who lived before his birth. Self-existent Son of God from heaven, he came to earth. It's Micah 5.2. And I'll give you the scriptures for each verse of this. Mary had the little lamb. See him in yonder stall. Virgin born, son of God, to save man from the fall. Isaiah 7, 14. Mary had the little lamb, obedient son of God. Everywhere the father led, his feet were sure to draw. John 6, 38. Mary had the little lamb crucified on the tree. The rejected Son of God, 
he died to set men free. And that's 1 Peter 1.18. Mary had the little lamb. Men placed him in the grave, thinking they were done with him. To death he was no slave. It's Matthew 28.6. Mary had the little lamb. Ascended now is he. All work on earth is ended. Our advocate to be. Hebrews 4.14-16. Four, Mary had the little lamb. Mystery to behold. From the Lamb of Calvary, a lion will unfold. Revelations 5 and 5 and 6. When the day star comes again, of this be very sure. It won't be lamb-like silence, but with the lion's roar. Psalm 212, Revelation 19, 11 through 16. And I just found this little poem. Uh, it was written by someone named Marv and Marbeth Rosenthal, uh, I would imagine a husband and wife. But the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit.